Hi, today we're going to look at a Newtone model N2510, which is sort of an unusual piece of equipment that you don't see very often. The N2510 is the intercom control master station for an N2500 stereo music intercom system. So if you have the 2500 receiver, and perhaps you have the turntable and the cassette player or even the 8-track player that went with it and you have more than one pair of stereo speakers wired directly off the receiver you need to have one of these because this allows you to have up to 12 set of stereo remote speakers or a mixture of stereo and mono remote speakers. This normally would be mounted somewhere away from the 2500 receiver. It's more of a utilitarian piece than a showpiece and once it gets set up you don't really play with it all that much. So sometimes it would be like in the kitchen area or the kitchen pantry or some out of the way place away from the giant six feet of Newtone 2500 system that you would have in your family room most likely or great room or something like that. I had somebody recently ask me, how do you clean the switches behind the 12 knobs? And that was a good question because most of the time when people send their 2500 receivers in for rebuild, they don't send the 2510. Every once in a while people will, but not too often. These switches have a tendency to become frozen sometimes. This one isn't particularly bad. They move pretty well. But I've seen these in people's houses where you actually can have to take the knob off and use a pair of pliers to try to turn the switch. That's how frozen they are. So today I'm going to show you how to get to the switches because it's not necessarily a really simple thing to do. So let's do a quick overview of what we're looking at here just so you have some idea. There is a speaker built into the station right here and if we pop the little door open which is tricky to do it doesn't it has a magnetic catch and it's a fairly strong magnet and it doesn't really want to open up for me here and I don't want to bend it it seems to be somewhat stuck Oh, well, okay, so here's why, because it actually opens the other way, like this. What do you know? If you do it the right way, it all works out. So there's a five inch speaker cone here on the back, and if this was installed in its wall housing, back inside here are the adjustments for your one AM preset and five FM presets that you can change as you move out around your house from the remote stations. So we'll close that back up. Here we have our intercom control buttons. We have door speakers, listen and talk. We have inside speakers, listen and talk. We have a volume control here. And this volume control is strictly for this speaker that's built into the door that someone didn't know which way it swung open. And then we have here our radio change. So we have AM or FM, and this button switches the band that the receiver is on. And then this button, FM change, allows you to scroll through your preset stations that you've set behind in the wall housing. And there's an indicator right here, it says FM channel, and it's numbered one through four, and I'll show you that on the back of, this, on the back of the unit. Here on the front, we have our 12 room control switches, and these are pretty standard for its day. We have an off position, we have radio and intercom, we have what they used to call standby, which is really intercom only. Standby is no music, just intercom. Or you can put that station in a monitor position and sounds in that room will be heard through the other speakers on the system. So this video is about how to get to the switches that are behind the faceplate because they need to be cleaned oftentimes and uh, it's not easy to do. So let's go ahead and get to it. Right, the first step that we have to do is we have to remove the 12 chrome knobs. And surprisingly enough, sometimes this is one of the hardest things you have to do. So I'm going to show you a little trick. Oftentimes you can just take them and pull them up with your fingers and they'll slide right off, but lots of times they won't. So we have a trick on how to do this, and what you need are two kitchen spoons. These are just standard size, the kind you eat your uh, rice checks with in the morning. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna use these as sort of little mini levers, and we put one under one side and one under the other side, and they have to be 
opposing each other. They have to be in a straight line across or 180 degrees apart and you push down on the handles of the spoons and it pries up on the knob on both sides at the same time and they slide right off. And we'll do this one. This is an old audio guy trick for removing stubborn knobs. The reason that you don't want to use a screwdriver and wedge it under this side and try to pry it up is because the way the knobs are made, and I'll do a more detailed thing about knobs in another video, there's the inner sleeve here which has the keeper that fits onto the control shaft, and then there's this space around it, and then there's the outer part of the knob. If you pry up on one side, you're torquing everything from one spot sideways. And you have to remember, like this set was made in 1980. So that makes it almost 40 years old. There are some of these that they made. This model goes back to the early 1970s, like 72. And these knobs are plastic and they get old and brittle. And if you pry up on one side, you can break the inner insert and then it won't stay on the knob or it's ruined. So you don't want to do that. You want to carefully, again, for the last time I'm going to show you, put one knob here, the other knob directly across from it, and pry up with the spoons carefully, and the knob will come right off. So now I'm going to take off the rest of them, and then we'll flip it over and uh, look at the back. The back side of our 2510, and as you can see, there's a lot of stuff going on back here. You've got working from one side to the other, but we'll start in the middle first. You have all of these giant bundles of wires here and here and here and here and don't forget this one. There are five of them and they all have these large differently shaped Molex connectors on them with the little pins inside and these plug into the terminal board that's inside the wall housing and each one of these is a distinctly different size, shape, and color except for these two maybe, which could possibly be the same, but one's red and one's black, and the sockets are color-coded, so you gotta be, you know, off your game to mess up that one. So behind all the wires, we have a variety of other things. We have our typical 70s and 80s support strap, missing its hook, of course. Here we have, this is the back side of the intercom control switches. Here's the back of our speaker cone the one on the door that somebody didn't know how to open. Here's our volume control for the speaker cone. This is the intercom control board over here. This is a mechanical latching relay, which is what spins the, the disc with the numbers on it to tell you which FM station you're on. And way down here underneath all of this, there are two boards, and these are the boards that contain all of the switches. Now, the way this is assembled is the frame of the 2510 are these aluminum channel pieces here, and everything is attached to the channels. So to, re to get to these switchboards to get them out, pretty much everything from this point over has to come out first so we can get to the nuts that allow the boards to come out. So let me go ahead and turn this around and I'll show you how to take it apart. Right, so I'm going to show you one of the things that I like to do first when I have to take one of these apart, but I'll show you after I explain this. So we're going to take the intercom control board out first. That's this assembly right here. So to get this out, we have to take out these two screws. These are quarter inch screws and I'm going to loosen them with a quarter inch nut driver. If you have nut drivers to do this, it will make your job a lot simpler. Now, what you want to do is you want to mark on the side of the bracket with a pencil where it's sitting exactly because that will make it easier to put it all back together later on. Now, another thing you have to do is there's going to be a variety of screws and nuts. We get out your little cup and guess where the screws go? In the cup because there aren't going to be any extra. And if you lose it, then what are you going to do? So once you take the screws out, you can lift the bracket up like this, and it just slides out of the channel in the bottom, and this board comes out. So you have to put this in a safe place while you're doing the rest of it, because finding one of these, nearly impossible nowadays. And if you break it, you're going to have a real problem. And then you're going to cry. So we'll put that out of the way. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to take our support strap off. So we'll mark that with the pencil. It really doesn't matter if you make some pencil lines on the back of the unit. In fact, 
I repaired the fella who asked me about this. I repaired his 2500 recently and written on the chassis his unit was made in 1972 and written on the chance on the chassis in pencil in a fairly good handwriting was the date of manufacture uh, when it was assembled I believe and the and the signature of the person that built it so that was pretty cool so we're going to take the volume control assembly off so we'll mark that on either side of the bracket and we'll take those screws out. The reason you have to take the volume control out is screws go in the cup. We have to get the relay out. Okay, and this doesn't really come out all the way, so we'll just sort of set it off to the side. We have to get this relay out, and to get the relay out, we have to take the screws out here and here, and we need the space over here. So we're also going to take the intercom control assembly out. So again, we're going to mark this and we'll take these screws out. Screws go in the cup. And we'll slide this and we'll just sort of tilt this up out of the way. Because now we have enough room to get to this assembly. And this assembly is held on with screws right here. So again, we'll mark it, and we'll take these screws out, and we'll lift our relay out of the way, and see that's a separate sub-assembly also, has its own cable on it, so that can be put off to the side. And now we're down to pretty much our two switchboard assemblies, which is this board and this board right here. Now these boards are held in with three brass nuts here, here, and here. And there's also the wires that go to the AM FM switch and the FM selector switch. We're not going to take these out or take the wires off of them because we don't really need to do that. If you're a little bit careful, it's okay. So to get the brass nuts out, you need a 5 16 nut driver. And we'll put those in the cup. And we'll retrieve the one that fell out right there. Now, we should be able to tip this up off the threaded studs. And I think it should slide out. However, doesn't seem to want to. So let me tip it up so I can see it better and then we'll see if we can get it. Okay, I figured it out. So I told you it's been a long time since I took one of these apart. So the trick here is you have to pull the bottom part of the boards up out of the channel first and then tip up the top and then lift it forward. It sort of locks in place that way. And once you get it up, you can flip it over without overly stressing all the wires, hopefully. It seems like it would be easier if this cardboard was detached. So let's go ahead and take the, the nut out for the piece of cardboard that covers up the back of the speaker. And now we can flip it over. Now you would think, aha, we're almost done. But we're not, because we have to take all these nuts off so we can take the metal plate off. So let me get a pair of pliers because that's the easiest way to do it. These are usually too large to use a nut driver on and also the shafts are too big and the nut driver doesn't, isn't deep enough and all of that. The best way to do this to take these nuts off is you just need a pair of standard slip joint pliers. Slip them on the, in the joint so the jaws are wider and then you put them on either side of the nuts and you turn them a part of a turn just to loosen them up a little bit. 
And for the most part, most of the time, once you get them a half a turn loose, they'll come off the rest of the way just with your fingers. That one and this one over here. It's a little trickier where the cardboard is. It's harder to get a good bite on it. All right, so then we'll just unscrew them like this. And as soon as I have them all off, I'll be back. All right, I saved the last one here. Take this last one off. Everything goes in the cup. If you lose things, you're not going to have any extra, and then what are you going to do? So we'll take the metal plate off. It probably would not be a bad idea to mark on the metal plate, which is the top, because when we flip it back over, that'll be the top, just in case. And here are our two switchboard assemblies. So we've got six on one board, six on the other board. And there's all of these dozens of different colored interconnect wires that go to the wiring harnesses and jumper in spots on the board and connect the boards together and all of these other kind of things. And you don't want to stress any of this any more than you have to because if a wire snaps off or comes out of a hole or has some other problem, how are you going to know where it goes? So you could always take some pictures of this with your phone if you wanted to, just in case. But if you're careful, it should pretty much be okay. Now, these switches are not the most exposed things in the world, so cleaning them can be a little tricky. But if you do it the right way and you do it carefully, you should be okay. So let me get a couple rags and I'll show you how to do that. Okay, so here's a close-up of two of the switches, here and here. Now, these are very high quality switches and what makes them difficult to turn are not the contacts underneath inside the switch, it's the plate that's right underneath the shiny silver part where there's a ball bearing and the plate pushes up against the ball bearing and every time you turn it the ball bearing jumps from one detent to the next and that's what gives it that all important click 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 thing that happens when you turn the knob so it stops in the right spot so there's two things that need to be done to clean these we need to clean the contacts that make the connections for the different functions and that's down here inside on this brown phenolic resin disc and it's buried down inside and you can't really see it very well. I can't really show it to you exactly because it's too hard to see. It's hard enough to see when you just look in there. We need two kinds of cleaners. We need our standard deoxid D5 to spray on the contacts down inside here in the gap but that's not those are not the parts that make it hard to turn. You get corrosion where the shaft goes down through the opening in the threaded part where the nuts go to hold it in place and that's the part that gets all sticky and gummy and makes it really really hard to turn. So we're going to do a two-step cleaning here. First we're going to take our standard deoxit D5, D5C, you can see it right there, deoxit D5 is what we recommend for all of this and we're going to spray some down inside where the switch contacts are. Now I've got this sitting on two white shop rags because you don't want to get spray all over the inside of your 2510 unit. You want to contain it as much as you can. So we'll spray a little bit in there and we'll just let it sort of soak for a bit. Now this is one of the few times ever that you're going to see me use some WD-40 because WD-40 is not the cure-all that everybody wants it to be and while it has its place it's not for everything and it's not for cleaning switch contacts. However, what we need is something like a WD-40 or a penetrating oil or spray. And we're going to spray a little bit here where the shaft of the switch goes through the opening where the threads are. Because what we need to have happen is we need it to loosen up. Now this is usually not an instantaneous process. So I spray it a little bit and then the good thing to do is you take your pliers and you work it back and forth. And this is one of those kind of things that 
you have to sort of use your judgment as you go along to see how much better it's getting. And sometimes what you have to do is spray it a little bit and work them back and forth. And when I say a little bit, we're talking about just the littlest bit. And yes, it's going to run down through the plate and get on the switch contacts, but in the end, what we're going to do is use our deoxit to sort of flush it away because we don't want to leave residue of WD-40. And yes, it's going to run off the board, and that's why you have the rags because it's kind of a messy project and it's going to take a while. You could easily let this go for two days if the switches are really, really, really frozen. These are pretty good and they turn very easily. However, sometimes if they're almost frozen completely and it takes a lot of twisting to get them to turn at all, you might have to do the WD-40 thing and then you might have to let it sit overnight and it sort of soaks in and penetrates and helps free things up. There's other kinds of pe penetrating sprays that you can get also. I recommend you get the lightest duty stuff you can find because there's no reason to go crazy about it. So that's pretty much what you have to do. See, it started on this one when I sprayed it. As I put just the littlest bit, you could see it sort of seep in, and that's what you want. You want to get it down inside where the shaft goes through the threaded part. Let's pretend that two days have passed and we've sprayed all of our shafts and they all now turn really easily. In fact, you can almost turn them pretty easily with your finger as compared to before where there's no way you could already turn it with your finger and yours are probably way worse than these. This is a shop unit. This is, I don't know if this was ever even installed in anyone's house. Once you get all of them cleaned with the WD-40 and they all turn very freely, then what you want to do is go through and spray your deoxid inside every switch. And it's going to run down the board and get caught in the rags and you can let it air dry and the, the residue deoxid will evaporate off the board and that's fine. And then when you get it done, it's time to put it all back together. So putting it back together is pretty much the reverse order of what we did before. We're going to put our plate back on it and we know which way the plate goes. Because if I recall correctly, we put an arrow. And just for the purposes of this demonstration, We'll put a couple nuts back on. Because the last thing anybody really wants to watch me do is stand here and put volume or switch shaft nuts back on. So we'll put these back on. And we'll use our pliers. And we'll snug them up. Now, when it comes time for snugging up, snugging up is it makes contact with the metal plate and then that much more, and that's all you need. You're not bolting down a drawbridge here. You're just tightening up the little nuts on the switch shaft, so let's not go overboard on it. We'll take our rags, move them out of the way, and we'll take the board and we'll flip it back over. Uh, we have to put our cardboard back on like this. So I guess we'll have to put at least these two on also just for the purposes of the demonstration I will reassemble this all together after I'm done with the video we'll put this back in here like this we'll line it up And you have to get the plate in the channel where it belongs. Which is a little tricky when you're standing off to the side. Like that. So I'm going to go ahead and put the nut back on one of them.
no catching the wires under the nuts. Make sure it's out of the way. All right, so let me flip this around, and since we have this apart, we're gonna take care of a couple other jobs while it's here. So we already have all of this apart. Now is a good time to clean the volume control pot that's for the speaker built into the 2510 and this is a fairly standard Newtone type volume control so you take your deoxit D5 and you spray a little bit right in the top where the tabs here come out of the top where the wires are soldered on there's always little gaps in here and it doesn't take much down inside and then you turn it back and forth and you can feel the resistance change. So then rotate it fully the other direction. Spray a little more. Of course, it's on over our rag to catch the runoff. And you can do this actually when it's all in place, but since we already have it apart, now seems to be the time to do it. That feels much better already. And you can feel the resistance change quickly as the D5 makes its way down into the volume control. So that takes care of that. Now the last thing we're going to do is we're going to clean our intercom push button switches. So when we put it all back together, they're not noisy. So this is the switchboard assembly, and these are the caps that poked out of the top or the faceplate of the 2510. And these are pretty standard Newtone's early 70s plunger style switches that they used in almost all models. And the nice thing about these are they're very easy to clean. So again, we'll take a rag and we'll put our rag here. And you can do this two different ways. You can spray them from the top right here where the red bands are and it'll make its way down inside or you can flip it over and spray it into the opening that's in the bottom of each switch. It doesn't really make any difference which way you do it. You don't necessarily have to take the caps off if you don't want to. I'll show you something about that. I'm going to spray down because, you know, gravity is our friend. And all you have to do is work them back and forth. Now, I've seen these in houses that when you push it down, it gets, take your finger off, it just stays there. That's how sticky and gummy these get. And they don't work well when they're like that at all. And for you folks who want to do anti-gravity, you can put the nozzle in the bottom. And spray a little bit. It doesn't hurt to go both ways if you want to. Make sure you get all the contacts inside really clean. And you just work them back and forth and it will distribute the deoxid D5 inside the switch and that should be all it really needs. Now I had somebody ask me once in a comment, well wouldn't it work better if you took the switch apart? Well, you can take the switch apart if you wanted to. However, likely you will never get it back together the way it was when it was made. There's little, the, the little white nylon piece right here is the plunger and it goes down inside and the contacts are on the sides of the plunger. When you pull it out and you take this apart and you pull the plunger out, all the little contacts fall off because they're not held on with anything. They just fit in these little slots and grooves. And I defy anyone who hasn't done it a million times to get it back together in one piece. Don't take the switches apart. You don't need to. All you're gonna do is create a problem for yourself that you don't need to have. So now we've cleaned everything for the most part, so let's go ahead and put it back together. You should also let everything air dry for a couple hours before you put it back together. There's no reason to have a lot of extra uh, runoff all over the inside of the 2510. So let's go ahead and put the 2510 back together. I went back and I put all the nuts back on all the switches, so that's all ready to go, and this is back in place. We'll put our two uh, remaining little brass nuts to hold our switchboard assemblies in place. These are always tricky, especially if you've got big fingers. But they're not too bad to do. Again, when you do this, you need to be careful because you don't want to 
pinch any of the wires underneath any of the brackets or anything like that because you can damage them or cars are short if it bites through the insulation and all of that would be bad. So now we're going to put our switchboard assembly back but first we have to put our, our piece of cardboard back over our speaker cone and we need to find the nut that went on there. There it is. So we'll put this back in like this. Now, this is a more extensive cleaning than what, than what most people would probably do. However, if you have frozen switches, this is what it takes. We'll take our switchboard and we'll put our button caps through the openings in the faceplate. And we'll start our screws by hand. And since we were smart, I think we were smart. The first ones are always the hardest ones. One of the things that happens with this is the, the strip that the screws go into fit into slots in the aluminum channel and it's a little bouncy. So getting the first screws in can be a little tricky because when you're trying to start them, the bouncy strip wants to move down. And then it's hard to get the screw to begin to thread in. But once you get the first thing in place, it makes it a lot easier. And we'll try tightening this one up first. Like that. And then we should be able to get this one in. Nope, still not there. This one's going to be tricky. See, part of the problem is the hole, the second hole right here through the plate is partially covered up by the very thinnest edge of the aluminum channel, which makes the hole just a little bit small. It's good planning on Newton's part. Maybe if we loosen this a little and this one a little, these are the screws that hold the plate in place and we back this one off just a little. See there has to be a trick to doing this. Aha! See now I was able to slide it up a little bit and now it goes right in. See there always is a trick because some person had to assemble this when this was brand new and they didn't stand there for 10 minutes horsing around trying to get one screw started. I'm sure if they did that, they probably would get fired. So there always is a trick. It may not be that obvious, but it's there nevertheless. All right, there's our volume control. And we have to make sure that we get the bracket adjusted correctly. So when you try to turn the volume control, you can turn it with your finger and it doesn't rub on the opening. So that's good. Now we have to put our relay back in. See, here's the, it, this is a latching relay. So every time it's energized, it has a cam and a gear here. So every time it goes, it turns the gear or the cam once. And on the front, it turns the disc with the numbers. Now it's got two sets of numbers because it goes around and around and around and around like that. So this one should be pretty easy. It goes right there. 
That one probably would have been simpler to do if we put it back in before we put the volume control back in. So I guess the relay was really the last thing we took out. So let's move this out of the way a minute. And do it this way. Fortunately, as with most things new tone, they only use one kind of screw, except for the brass nuts, which are bigger, which is actually kind of unusual. But new tone always was really good about not wanting to buy a whole bunch of different kinds of screws, I guess, because most things are all assembled with the same kind of screws and what kind of screws those are vary over time. You see a lot of these quarter inch nut driver screws. They are slotted. They have a little tiny slot in here, but the slot is really shallow. And unless you've got a really properly sized and really square screwdriver, Kind of hard to do it with a screwdriver. That's why a nut driver works out so well. Okay, no scraping, so that's good. And yeah, that's fine. And now the last thing we have to put in is our intercom control board here. And that goes down. You put the bottom part of the bracket in the slot in the aluminum frame first. And then you just lie it down in place. And because somebody was smart enough to put pencil marks, you know exactly where it's supposed to sit. How about that? And now that we have all that in, we'll do our two screws, one at each end for the strap that everything screws into so it doesn't wobble around. And that's pretty much it. We'll flip it over. And our 2510 is reassembled. Oh, except for our knobs. We have to put our knobs back on. So let's go ahead and do that. I almost forgot. We have one more thing off to the side. We have our support strap. You know, the one that's missing this, the hook on the end. Now, as for making a hook, if you take a jumbo size paper clip, or if you take a piece of like 12 gauge wire, you can bend it around and lock it through one of the holes and make your own replacement hook because especially with this unit, the hook makes it a lot easier to put everything back together. So now it's all done except for our knobs. Okay, so we have to put our knobs back on. Oh, look, our mysterious door that swings the wrong way is open. How'd that happen? All right, so the knobs are keyed. They're, they're called, these are D-shaped shafts as a flat side and inside the knob, the keeper has a flat side. So all you really have to do is line up the flat sides and slide them back on. If you wanna be real detail oriented when you do this, when you have the switchboards out and you're cleaning the shafts so they turn easily and you're spraying the contacts with your deoxit D5, you can take a blue Scotch-Brite pad and you can carefully clean the shafts like this and back and forth this way to clean off residue. If you drag your fingers across these, you can feel that they're kind of sticky. And if you clean them up a little bit, that makes the, sh the knobs easier to put back on and perhaps if you have to take it off later on it will be easier to do. However, you know about the secret spoon trick now so you can be the envy of all of your friends who have stereos with stuck knobs and like that. So here's our cleaned 2510. Our switches have all been cleaned. They all work well. We cleaned our volume control. It rotates freely. There's no drag and it doesn't rub on the cutout. We cleaned our plunger switches and that's it. So this is my shop 2510. The customer who I did the 2500 
prepare for, didn't send his, but he's gonna do this himself, so that's why I made the video. Got another 2500 coming in, and when I rebuild that one, I have an extensive rebuild video on the 2500 already, but uh, when I do testing on that one, I'll show you how this all hooks up and we'll do a little intercomming on a 2500 system. So that's all. I hope you found this interesting and perhaps helpful. If you did, please give it a big thumbs up on YouTube because that always helps. There'll be a banner right here that shows you how to subscribe. Go to our YouTube homepage, click on the bell or on the wheel, put in your email address, and every time we post a new video, you'll get a notification and you can watch it. That's all for today. See you on the next video.